Today is day one of this big sampling event that we're doing where we're measuring sound on oyster reefs all up and down the coast. This is a hydrophone, so a microphone that records underwater. Wow, that's it's a whole new dimension to how we need to think about the ecology of fear. But I bet it, that initial sort of poke is going to lead to a, a lot sort of more questions. Oyster reefs support communities of animals. Some, like this mud crab, trying to enjoy its oyster, live on the reef. Others, like the fish who steal the oyster, use the reef for food and protection from larger predators. Oyster reefs support human communities as well. When oyster reefs fail, it threatens these communities. You know, this is Mother Nature and it's worse. We faced hurricanes, tropical storms, you know, floods. But, but you can always bounce back from something like that. You can't bounce back from, from lack of fresh water. Apalachicola Bay is home to Florida's largest oyster fishery. The failure of its reefs in 2012 is a wound on the forgotten coast. This region is a patchwork of fishing towns and protected land and water resources. It's a place built by plant and animal interactions in oyster reef, salt marsh, and seagrass bed ecosystems. It's an ideal place to conduct research. So why we are out here really boils down to our needing to figure out the many different ways that biodiversity and predators help keep these habitats healthy and therefore important to us. Even at a raw bar just off the bay, Apalachicola oysters are hard to find. What killed these reefs has nothing to do with a mud crab's ability to hear or how much predator sounds scare it. So just how important is the ecology of fear to an oyster reef? David reflected on this just before his lab started work in Apalachicola Bay. For 10 years we've been studying these cool behavioral patterns in oyster reefs. We thought that it would be cool if we put our own ideas to the ultimate test and we take them out into nature and really see how important are these behavioral results that we you know, worked on 10 years ago that we thought are really cool. Are they really important or are they just a drop in the bucket? Do they really matter? As Randall starts this exciting new chapter in their research, she encounters the remnants of a previous experiment conducted by her and David. After leaving some experimental tiles on these reefs for a few years, they may have discovered a new method of oyster farming. We stopped taking these tiles and the experiment ended, but we never got around to collecting them and then Spat continued to recruit onto this tile. And since it was protected in this cage, nothing ate the spat, and they just grew into this massive mound of oysters on this tile. Over the last four years, small tiles and cages like these have been a major component of all of the oyster research conducted in the Hughes and Kimbrough labs. It's a tool that was developed in the quest to better understand oyster reefs. Basic science is science for science's sake. Sometimes we don't know what science is going to be interesting later on or going to have big repercussions for people, and we just want to understand how things work. Doing stuff for the sake of knowledge. So this is a crown talk. And you know, the general public may not get why that's being funded. Applied science is more there's a problem that we know we need to fix or need to address and we develop our science to sort of answer that particular question. But ultimately a lot of basic uh, research answers can be compiled to address societal problems, and that is applied research. So it's, you know, we, we often characterize it as one or the other, but they're actually sort of on the same continuum. Woo! In Apalachicola Bay, 
oyster stalks are still recovering from a drought-induced ecosystem failure. There, tiles were deployed to both answer questions about the cause of the collapse and to monitor recovery. A major indicator of the health of an oyster reef is the health of its larval oysters, spat. When David and his colleagues perfected their use of the tiles, it was for a three-year National Science Foundation-funded study on the ecology of fear on oyster reefs. David and Randall were faculty at the Florida State University Coastal and Marine Lab. We found some really cool stuff 10 years ago. So we, it was my good friend, now colleague, but at the time he was my boss, uh, Dr. John Grabowski. He was a grad student and I was just hired help. Dave worked with me uh, when I was in graduate school at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He was a technician with me for about two years and worked on a number of oyster reef projects with me. But he showed this really cool thing where um, the influence of these predators can influence their prey and that can influence like the oyster habitat. And so classic theory had it that that was all done by predators eating prey and then the prey not eating the oysters. But he showed that you could get the same response just through the effect of fear. When oysters eat, they alert predators to their presence. They can hide by not eating. Of course, too much of this would stunt their growth and affect their health. Consumption just affects one prey individual. Fear can affect everybody. So people are arguing that you know, it may have a much, much larger effect than pure predator consumption. Dave contacted me maybe a year and a half ago with the idea of let's take some of the things we worked on back in North Carolina and extend it and see you know, what really drives patterns in oyster reef communities. We were talking and a lot of that stuff was done just in North Carolina and so we were thinking that well, let's really test this and because there could be a lot of things that could make that, that situation change. Um, in certain areas for whatever reason it could be all about behavior. But in other areas, there might be things about the water or whatever that disrupt all that behavior and it could revert back to sort of the classic ecology. Like any study, the first day is exciting slash scary. It's exciting because you're just starting a new project, but it's scary because you just, nature's so big, you just don't even know where to begin. The next time David went out, he had gotten his crew in place. Hannah and Tanya had recently received undergraduate degrees. Evan was enrolled at Florida State University. With this larger crew, they began to look at the health and size of oysters, what was living in and around the reef, and the quality of the water around the reef. After sampling for a few months, they had a better sense of the reefs as a whole. They knew the differences in predators and environmental conditions from Florida to North Carolina. They then narrowed their focus to the individual oyster. How it grows, survives, and it's sort of doing that from North Carolina to Florida and seeing how it depends on the environment, um, how it depends on the presence or absence of predators. Because ultimately, whether or not the oyster survives, how quickly it grows or doesn't, the aggregation of thousands of those at each site sort of dictates what your reef looks like and what it's doing. To look at oyster growth, they used spat tiles. They arranged rows of oyster spat on small hardware store tiles. Some were left exposed to predators, others were caged. If the caged oysters died or didn't grow, it wasn't because they had gotten eaten. The cause could either be environmental as it might be in Apalachicola, where freshwater input was low over an extended amount of time. Or they may have, in a way, been scared to death. Or maybe, as in the first time they ran it, the glue on the tiles wasn't as strong as it needed to be, and the spat just washed away. After its initial run, they made a few changes to the experiment design. It's like toxic silly putty. <laughs> it's far, it can be fun to work with. It's kind of like you know, arts and crafts and science. Um, 
this is like for like repairing the bottom of boats. And that's the advantage of this little pier underwater. In addition to the stronger adhesive, they started putting the tiles upright to mimic the direction oysters grow. In summer of 2012, Randall conducted the experiment using her own modifications. Today we're picking up the tiles that we put out six weeks ago for what we call our Tile 2.0 experiment. Um, and then we'll take them back to the lab and measure them and see what's gone on in the last six weeks. David has been the lead of this entire project, not just the Florida portion, but the whole group effort. The first year, um, I took more of a backseat role, um, just sort of providing input, and he was really sort of managing things. And then as we got going, um, there were some components of the project that <laughs> fell in line better with my interest or um, were just things that I really thought were neat. And so I would sort of take charge of those and, and then David would continue leading the overall effort. So one of those things was the Tile 2.0 project. Randall and David met while working for John Grabowski. When John was a graduate student, I worked for him as a technician. It was my first field research experience, and actually on oyster reefs. Since then, Randall and David had been collaborators in life and in research. But they also have work outside of this collaboration. Randall's work on salt marshes in particular influenced the Tile 2.0 experiment. So Tile 1.0 was this big massive effort that I was sort of again playing the backup role on. And then we decided to do it a little differently and um, rather than collecting oyster spat from the field, we decided to raise them in a hatchery and that opened up new possibilities. In the first tile experiment, clumps of reef were harvested and they would look for dead shell where spat had settled. David then painstakingly used a Dremel saw to remove bits of shell without killing the spat. The new approach simplified this. We could collect the oyster parents from different areas and rear these families separately in the hatchery and look at some of these sort of within species diversity questions that I find really interesting. So the experiment we're doing, we have the different families of oysters uh, that came from different sites along the Atlantic coast. So for example, this one is from Ace Basin in South Carolina. And we're putting them all out on the reefs. What they were trying to see was, within the same conditions of each reef, how did the families differ in how they grew? And how susceptible were they to predators? Randall ran a similar experiment in St. Joseph Bay with black mangroves. I think the first thing that got me interested in mangroves was just the fact that they were up here. Mangroves don't have a very great cold tolerance. So if it freezes and is a sustained freeze, they typically um, will die, especially the red mangroves and also the black mangroves. But it does seem, in talking with people who've lived in this area for a long time, that although they've always been around, they do seem to be getting more abundant. And so that also got us interested in what's driving that. Many elements of this experiment are familiar. We've gone all over the state and collected mangrove seedlings and brought them to St. Joe Bay and planted them and just sort of watched them over time to see who grows the best, who survives the best, who gets eaten the most, and see if we can figure out if there's any predictability in terms of where they come from and how they do. Mangroves and marshes are fairly analogous habitats. They occur in the intertidal. Mangroves typically occur in South Florida and in the tropics, and then north of there you get marsh becoming the dominant intertidal habitat. Rising temperatures could mean a continuing increase in black mangroves in North Florida. Will they take over the marsh? Will they change the services that we rely on, that the marsh provides? Randall conducted a four-year NSF-funded study into salt marsh ecology. Part of her interest in marshes is a commonality with oyster reefs. They are vulnerable to drought. There have been serious droughts starting in the late 1990s that were linked to marsh die-off. And while these plants were stressed by drought, they also became more vulnerable to snails that graze on the plants. And so those two factors combined led to major die-offs of the marsh. A study conducted by Dr. Brian Silman while at the University of Florida found that snails could overgraze Spartina that had already been weakened by high salinity. 
they can graze the plants and cause a fungal infection that can then cause widespread die-off. These snails can eat a lot of different things and they eat dead plant material, but they can also use their radula, their little feeding apparatus, to, to scrape a little scar on the live Spartina and then that can be colonized by fungus and they'll consume that fungus. So when I came to Florida in 2008, I was aware of the work that had been done in salt marshes and the salt marsh die-off. And when I started sort of walking around in the marsh, I found that lo and behold, we have a ton of the same marsh periwinkles that have been causing the die-off in other areas. And yet we didn't really see a lot of die-off. And so I got really curious as to whether there was something else going on in this system that may prevent die-off from happening or make it less likely. And, and so I got very interested in diversity. From a distance, diversity isn't the first word that comes to mind when talking salt marshes. It is an ecosystem heavily dominated by Spartina alterniflora, smooth cordgrass. Much of the diversity Randall studies in the marsh is in relation to this one key plant species. Fiddler crab burrows bring oxygen to cordgrass roots. Needle rush is taller than Spartina, so it attracts periwinkles that might otherwise climb on and graze Spartina. Randall's graduate student, Althea, was looking at mussels. Mussels and Spartina have been shown to have a mutually beneficial interaction. The mussels can provide stability for Spartina. Mussels can also provide nutrients in areas where plants are limited by lack of nutrients. We'll have more on bivalves and nutrients in a little bit. While she was at Wakulla Beach checking on another experiment, she noticed that sea lavender, or limonium, would always grow together with mussels. She wondered, did they somehow benefit each other? I guess as an ecologist you have an intuition. You notice a pattern and you assume that um, it means something or you, you expect that it might mean something. Um, but then you have to rigorously test it, obviously. So she conducted an experiment. Some plots had just mussels, others just limonium. Some plots had limonium with different amounts of mussels. One of my hypotheses is that at very high densities, the mussels could actually become detrimental to the plants. So maybe at a certain density, the mussels could be either providing nutrients or stability for the plants, but at higher densities, they might actually crowd out the plant too much. You know, it's... It's a process, science. I don't know really what the answer is yet. Many of the animals Randall looked at, fiddlers, mussels, and periwinkle snails, exist towards the bottom of the food web. They are depended upon by animals that are higher on the food web. Humans, in turn, depend on those animals. The devil crab, you can eat with a cracker at the dip. Smoked mullet dip. In fact, Everything but the bacon wrapped around the shrimp likely spent part of its life in a salt marsh. We catch blue crabs, stone crabs, mullet, flounder, sheephead. What's well, not to like it? I got the most beautiful office in the world. I get to do what I love. The people that, that come with this kind of work and, and being out on that water every day, there's nothing else I could imagine myself doing. I can go for crabs in it. Look at the stone crabs, three humongous stone crabs. The number of plant and animal species in the marsh is its species diversity. It's easy to see and easy to understand. But what interested Randall most was genetic diversity. That's not as easy to see in a marsh. A marsh could have very many, or not so many, Spartina genotypes. A genotype is just a word we use to uh, describe different genetic individuals. So with people, Everybody is their own genotype, even though some are more closely related than others. With plants, you can have a single plant that sends out a runner underground and then has another stem come up. And so here you can see these are developing stems that will work their way above ground eventually. And those are genetically identical, and so those are the same genotype. How did the number of Spartina genotypes in a marsh determine its health? Randall came up with a plan to find out. When you write the proposal to get funding, you have to lay out a very concrete and specific plan of, you know, how you're going to address these different questions. I definitely ran into the problem of that very specific and concrete plan didn't work out quite as I expected it to. 
For example, I needed to have different genotypes of Spartina to do these experiments with. I expected that that would take maybe six months to, to get them growing and have enough to do. And it really took about two years before we could start the experiments that were planned to happen in year one. In the meantime, we didn't just twiddle our thumbs, we did new experiments that we could do without knowing the genotypes of Spartina. So we've done a lot of work, but it's taken longer than I expected to sort of get to the big questions of the original grant. Yeah, so the different plants have different personalities. One, like this one over here, may be taller with not as many shoots, and then you may have a shorter one with, uh, you know, fewer shoots over here and so forth. And so working with these in the greenhouse, we've sort of gotten a feel for their characteristics. And what we've done here is plant them out in the field so we can see, depending on what environment they're growing in, does that personality or do those characteristics change or do they stay consistent depending on whether they're growing with other plants just like themselves or, or a different group of plants. So kind of like when I go to my hometown in Georgia, uh, apparently my southern accent becomes stronger um, versus when I'm uh, with my friends from grad school in California when you can't uh, tell as dramatically that I'm from the south. So these plants may do a similar thing and sort of change their traits depending on what environment they're in. So like 2-2 two -two is going to be a monoculture of this gene. Similar experiments with slight variations let Randall answer fine-tuned questions about genetics. Today we're planting a new experiment with the same genotypes of Spartina that we've been working with before. These are plants that we've had growing in the greenhouse for several years now and we know, um, so for example this plant which we call S21 um, is the same genetic individual as this S21 and this one and this one. So all of these plants came from the same original stem They've just expanded over time and we've split them apart into different pots and kept track of them. This experiment is looking at whether it matters how many genotypes you have in a plot. So there will either be one, some have two different genotypes, and some have four different genotypes. But the other thing that we're interested in is whether it matters how related those individuals are. A genetic recipe for creating a healthy marsh would have practical benefits. It would enhance restoration efforts like Choctahatchee Basin Alliance's grasses and classes. That looks really good. Parts of Choctahatchee Bay are experiencing erosion after development along the shore replaced its wetlands. The marshes the CBA plants, along with the reefs they build in the oyster recycling program, help to stabilize the shoreline. I'm just saying we don't really have to monitor sediment accumulation anymore because this reef is actually four bags high, which means it's approximately two feet high, but the, uh, it's accumulated so much sediment, it's really only the top of layer of bags that's showing through right now. Marshes and reefs offer similar services. They make a home for animals, which supports the yes. seafood industry. Yes, that's beautiful. I buy cats, it's beautiful male crab. They build our coast and offer protection from storm surge. But when Randall and David looked at oyster growth and the health of the reef in their biogeographic study, they were concerned with another oyster service. How reefs are filtering in water and pooping it out, and whether that's influencing denitrification. How do those things change from North Carolina to Florida? Well, I don't think I can do it short and sweet. <laughs> well, then do the long one. And I'll All right, dude, you can cut it down. <laughs> hey. So right, now we're going back to like oysters eating and pooping, right? And so that's creating some new organic matter around the oyster clump. And so I said, you know, maybe that primes the sediments to promote nitrogen going from this really usable form, the algae can suck up like that and then bloom, right? And that's bad ultimately if nothing eats it, sinks down, dies, senesces, bacteria eat it up, eat up all the oxygen, fish kills, blah, all right. <laughs> So you can edit all that out if it's too long. But going forward now, Tanya, are you doing all right? Are you concentrating? Um, yes. All right. I don't want you to get distracted with my prose. Yeah. Okay. My, my verse. Right. We'll save you some time. Oysters eat by filtering all that water that floats around them. This removes excess nitrogen from the water. Nitrogen helps plants grow, but it can also help harmful algae grow and suck the oxygen out of the water, killing marine species. Oysters might help to convert it into a form of nitrogen that does not fuel plants. Oysters feeding and pooping can possibly ultimately take really um, highly usable forms of nitrogen, like 
you know, the stuff you put on your garden and take it to the stuff that's not usable um, and clean up our water. So. so where does fear fit into this equation? When oysters stop eating to hide from their predators, they don't grow and they don't filter water. Likewise, larger predators scare the mud crabs that eat the oysters. When the mud crabs are too scared to eat and hide themselves, oysters can continue to filter water and grow. That's the theory. And so, once David and Randall knew the predators, and a little about how oysters were growing at their sites, they tied it all together in their largest experiment. The big effort of the group, I mean, there have been a lot of big efforts, but the largest one, I would say, was this cage experiment that we did from Florida to North Carolina. We first constructed oyster reefs in areas where there weren't oyster reefs. We created reefs that were like nine feet in diameter. So these are huge reefs, huge from my experimental perspective, but not compared to like an oysterman's perspective. We harvested natural oyster reefs, took them in the lab and completely kind of cleaned them. Like you would take an oyster cluster to a dentist, swim through there and removed every little thing so that we knew exactly what these reefs looked like. And then we had to, you know, put cages around them and dig the cages in, and then... And then we went and collected mud crab and snail consumers of oysters and got all the sort of information, like we we're testing them for whether or not they deserve life insurance policies or not. We knew everything about them. And then we did the same thing with predators. We had to put tiles in the reef so we could see how spat do in the different conditions. We said, okay, these reefs get consumers of oysters. These reefs don't. These reefs get consumers and predators that like to eat the consumers of oysters. Then we got to follow through time how these reefs that started off the same, how they sort of diverged in their condition, how they're filtering and pooping and influencing denitrification or the removal of excess nitrogen from our coastal waters. Tanya explained the design of the cages. So there'll be three sub cages that are going to be located here. Here and here. See this guy in here? Mud crabs can still sense a caged toadfish, but the toadfish can't eat them. And then there's equivalent non subcage areas which are going here. And the edge of our reef is going to be about here. So it, those cages kind of straddle the reef like this. The experiment had combinations of catfish, toadfish, blue crabs, mud crabs, and more tiles to boot, all in controlled oyster reef ecosystems. If I hadn't decided to go into biology, I probably would have gone into art. So I really like drawing and art things. So. But as kind of a side hobby, I've been getting into scientific illustration and have been drawing t-shirts and uh, I've also been making illustrations for um, David and Randall's publications of various marine animals to stick on their bar graphs. So, so I've been able to pursue science while also having science and art, and art as a, a side thing that I do. Unfortunately, had like the worst weather possible for a breakdown. The tides on Math are very driven by the winds. Whether we go out or not is very dependent on what the wind is doing. So we're always checking the wind, we're always checking the tides, and hoping that they're in our favor on at least one day during the lowest tide series when we can work out at the same bar. On that day, they had no choice but to go out. Tanya would be leaving soon and the experiment had to be taken down. The data had to be collected. Typically, there are only a few days each month where the tide exposes the seagrass beds of Baymouth Bar. That's if the weather cooperates. When I arrived here a long time ago, just as a postdoc, Bob Payne, sort of like one of the forefathers of how we conduct ecology now, he had done his postdoc research here back in the late 50s and he had worked on Baymouth Bar and he'd studied these large carnivorous snails, which according to him are the largest and most diverse in the world. That just kind of jumps out at you. It's like, I gotta get out there. But Bob was visiting and I got to go out with him when he was sort of resampling 
the way he did back in the 50s, just to see how things have changed or not. You know, some of the snails are buried, and so I'm trying to kick them up. Dr. Payne's observations of snails on the bar shaped his pioneering work on apex predators. Here, those are horse conchs. Throughout the warmer months, the horse conch is top predator. Dr. Payne noticed that when it left in the winter, the lightning whelk, which eats large clams, became top predator. This changed the abundance of the snails and clams in the bar, but the effects went further than that, into the ground. And the whole complexion of the bay changes from winter to summer. And so we're interested in you know, some of the big snails are hanging out here, and some of the smaller snails are hanging up there. And so we were wondering, are there any patterns within the sediments that reflect that sort of seasonal and spatial pattern of the snails? So we came out here and just did, we dug up a, a buttload of sediment and hauled it back to the lab and worked through what was in the sediment and mirroring the snail patterns were some really cool clam patterns. Like oysters and mussels, clams filter water, possibly to the benefit of seagrasses. These seagrasses support an incredible diversity of life. It is an ecosystem ruled by its predators. The pear whelk eats the moon snail. The horse conch eats the lightning whelk. The lightning whelk eats clams. And the clams filter water. After two years of sampling, their first experiment looked at how clams were being eaten and scared in the bar. I think it's about a month ago. So it used to be about this big, and that's where this line is from. All this is new growth since we put it out. As in the other experiments, some of the clams were exposed to predators. Uh, this one's live. And others were protected. Death of 20. This was followed by a bigger experiment. Low tide tonight is at 10.15 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. What time is it now? It is currently... 820, <laughs> not too bad. Uh, hoping the wind dies down, but if not, then looks like the tidal still drops, so we should be all right. <laughs> so, that's what you get them. so this is what I was doing all day yesterday and today. The bar's limited tidal window dictated her working schedule. That day, it was dry, but she worked into the night to set up the experiment. I came and compared our data to Payne's data and found a number of interesting differences. <laughs> of the six main snail species found on the sandbar in Payne's time, two of them were no longer found there, which are these uh, murex snails and uh, two tulips. The experiment I'm doing is essentially to compare the historical assemblage of consumer gastropod species to the current assemblage of gastropod species and how they affect the bivalve community and seagrasses. In other words, is one predator or the other, or possibly both, better for the sediments? Since she's not working with crabs and fish, she won't need a cage. Z-spar and fishing line will keep the snails to a confined area, and they'll have plenty of clams to eat in the sediment. So right this week was the last, well, it's basically the last low tide series of the summer. So it's, it's a really early chance to break down this experiment. I'm also going to be leaving Florida this August to go up to Northeastern to start a PhD program there, of which this Bayreuth project will be part of my dissertation. I was applying to a different program a while ago, like back in October. It was a really like prestigious lab and I went and interviewed there. And I really wanted to go there. But then I got rejected. <laughs> so that didn't happen. But 
I was pretty upset about it for a while, so like I kind of ended up not applying to any PhD programs that that year. But I really wanted to do something, so I decided to apply to a master's program at Northeastern Norbert David. So then this project would have been like my master's thesis. So I applied there, and then I got to that interview, and it went really well. And then I subsequently learned that oh, actually they're not taking master's students. <laughs> Okay, but they offer me a PhD <laughs> position. And like, I really like working with David, and I think we work really well together, and happy with things, how they turn out. Okay, yeah, I got a new job. Um, it's at Northeastern University. Hey, Northeastern. And, uh, you know, we left, so it's July now, we left in January. They're doing a lot of, you know, this stuff kind of without you. What's that like? That's been tough. You feel so divorced from the actual project. And at a certain point, you kind of feel like an inhibitor because you want to know what's going on every step of the way, especially when we got going with that bunch of cool stuff. This right here is a huge bowl. So yeah, we do like a southwest, southeast. Okay. Yeah, so we can see how they are. Like After sort of a lot of probably causing some slowing things down, I. In the middle of the spring, probably stepped back a little bit and trusted that they had worked with me so much the past three years. They, they know how I'd want it to get done. I want to see a couple of tall legs, boy. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's exactly what it is. Head over to this Just as David and Randall were getting ready to head to Northeastern, the Apalachicola Bay oyster fishery failed. Not many oysters were found when the winter harvesting area opened, and oyster men had to work harder for less money. Years of drought in the Apalachicola Chattahoochee Flint Basin reduced freshwater input from the Apalachicola River to its bay. Drought in Georgia meant that the Army Corps of Engineers further reserved water from the Apalachicola, making 2012 the driest year on record. Get some oysters. David joined the Oyster Recovery Task Force, though he would have to manage the project from afar. I told that boy this morning, he was talking about he wasn't interested in getting into this program that they're trying to, you know, go to school for another trade or whatever. I told him, I said, look, I said, the way these things are dying off and the way that, you know, our spat season looks this year, you might want to find something else. Because this very well may be the end of what we have always done it. Well, yeah, yeah. Like I said, we went through a bad hurricane in 85, and it messed us up for about two years, but it come back. But we was able to see it coming back over that period of time. Right now, we're not seeing much of anything. Spats is very few, and what few spats there are, they're popping open just like the adult oysters are. We've been measuring a lot of fresh open little spat yeah. In Hannah, David had someone who had worked on oyster reefs with similar issues. So Hannah's about to submit her first paper. It's great because I feel like it was just yesterday that you know, I was on that end. <laughs> it's so much nicer being on this end. It started when they were sampling their St. Augustine reefs in the biogeographic study. I had not conducted research in St. Augustine before, so I was pretty ignorant. But in doing the research that we had already planned there, I quickly noticed the sort of, you know, battle line of, to the north of that line, the reefs look pretty good, just like every other reef I've seen. But to the south of that battle line, the reefs look horrible. And there are these snails just slithering all over these reefs. You know, within the first week, I met local oystermen who had um, harvested oysters from these areas that now look like crap for, you know, generations and to learn that they had just sort of a couple years ago abandoned those because they could no longer find harvest sized oysters, marketable sized oysters. We began to notice that there's this abundance of this one gastropod predator, these crown conchs, and so um, I sort of took a lot of interest into this. That started to evolve into a project of my own. No one had really taken any time to investigate this problem in the area, and so that sort of sparked our main interest in trying to investigate further of the implications of these crown conchs in the area. In this treatment here, we have crown conchs 
that are housed on um, either side of the cage. And so the conch cues are supposedly queuing off to these oysters that are growing inside and potentially causing these oysters to grow differently than if these oysters were receiving mud crab cues like in our other treatments. But it wasn't fear that was hurting the reefs. They did find elevated salinity in parts of the estuary. However, we found that salinity does have an influence on this crown conch, but more importantly, the oysters themselves are just being directly influenced by this crown conch consumption. The reefs were being mowed down by snails. It had seemed like a unique and very local problem. When I was tapped to help join the oyster task force, once the Appalachia Cola oyster fishery was sort of declared, you know, not viable anymore. I quickly went out with the people that had been uh, sort of monitoring oyster reefs in Apachicola, and in doing that, we noticed the same sort of snail pattern that we noticed over in St. Augustine. Doing research on behalf of the U.S. Park Service, they had found another set of reefs with a conch problem at Canaveral National Seashore. When we sort of put it all together and said, wow, this conch thing is probably a really regionally important phenomena that people really need to get a handle on. As in the biogeographic study, they started by getting samples of the We're reef. Probably like the lines right there. When they started surveying in January of 2013, much of what they saw was not surprising. As advertised, the resource is in pretty bad shape. When you get down there and you dive on where the reefs are, they do generally tend to look like a gravel parking lot. During these initial surveys, however, they weren't seeing many snails. My team, pretty much my graduate student, Hannah Garland, you can raise your hand, Hannah. Um, she's been on the bay uh, you know, considerably since uh, January, and I think it's just seasonal. Um, there are tremendously less predators than what I saw just doing <clears throat> preliminary data collection with FDAX back in October. Oh, I got a mustard draw on this guy. They're seasonal organisms, so I imagine um, if there's still a problem, when we go back out and sample again this next month, we'll see them. I get made fun of for taking a lot of pictures, but... Many oyster predators prefer saltier water. In February 2013, however, the ACF basin started receiving much needed rain. Did that mean that predators wouldn't return when it got warmer? For David to get a handle on predator involvement in the bay, he'd have to have an experiment in place before the seasonal change. And for that, he'd need oysters. Uh, I'm going to need 500? Yes, what it want, 500. Uh, how many bags is that? Uh, that's about two bushels. So we were, me and Daddy come over here about two months ago and couldn't even find that right there. That's on the board now. That's right. Things getting better, you think? or? Uh, more shells. I don't, there ain't a whole lot more oysters. There's more shells. Yeah, I'll be paying for this tomorrow. I'll be so worse off from me. When was the last time you went to uh, Tongue Oysters? Seven, eight weeks ago. As you can see, there ain't really any reason to come out here. Right. That right here puts us one quarter of the way. One twenty-five, right? In just under two hours, he's harvested half a bag of oysters. He used to get a bag in about forty-five minutes. The next hour does not go well. Yeah, I'm done. Exactly. 
it, it was better whenever whenever I quit than what it is right now. So, uh, so it, it's still it's still declining. It ain't it ain't going it ain't getting better. But now I do see a lot more spasms. You know, the little baby was doing spasms. No, it, unfortunately, it wasn't surprising. I mean, based on our surveys, when, when Stephanie and I were swimming the transacts, I mean, we were rarely seeing healthy big clumps. And even right here, this is a gaper <laughs> that I have to see right here, so we can't even use this oyster. But um, no, I mean, it certainly wasn't surprising that he only got 100 or so oysters in, after four hours of tonging. It's, it's the reality of what's out there. The experiment used adult oysters as well as tiles. This time, the health of the caged oysters would tell them how oysters responded to environmental factors and not fear. Some adults were sent to a hatchery to get spat from Apalachicola stock. The biggest difference from their previous experiments was that these would be subtidal, always submerged, and would have to be protected from oyster tongs and boat propellers. This meant learning some new skills. After Stephanie had built enough cages, they deployed. The experiment went up in April. By June, they were inundated with predators. Is the, have you been finding all the crampons? We have, but um, significantly more the oyster girls. In July, David came down to see the experiment for himself. Nine. Well, we did uh, a couple of experiments. You know, we put these guys out, so they're like this and they're unprotected. And then right beside them, we put guys out that were fully protected. And we did it once and we saw, when you pulled these up, you know, all these guys were gaping open dead. And then the little guys right beside them that were protected weren't. Okay, in 64, they're all alive. So that's kind of a telltale sign of something ate it. It wasn't the environment that did something to it. And so that started to kind of give me a little more confidence about my original hypothesis. It's kind of what we're finding over on the Atlantic coast too, where the water is older. It gets saltier. Crown conch over in St. Augustine was you know, experiencing higher reproductive rates and um, it seemed like you know, there's higher abundances in regions where there was higher salinity. This cage is covered in oyster drill egg sacs. Each one holds 10 to 20 oyster drill larvae. At first glance, it looked like the Apalachicola oyster drills were also breeding more in the saltier water, but they'd have to do additional testing to be sure. Predators are definitely a part of the story. And so now we just need to get other pieces of information to figure out what it could be things in addition to predators. It could be like there's no recruitment happening. So we just keep going, keep chopping wood. Follow-up testing was never done. A lot of the work we're doing is funded by the National Science Foundation. Sea Grant has given us some money, but you know, the bulk of what we're doing is overlaying on top of the three to four year study that you've been following with us all throughout northern Florida up to North Carolina. Um, and that funding as well as the Sea Grant stuff is, you know, it's running out. You know, we can't keep going unless we get some more funding. David is currently working to get funding for a follow-up study. You know, at the end of our big biogeographic basic study, we perfected all these techniques to learn how the environment influences oysters, how do predators influence it, what are the logistics of carrying out that experiment. All that information, all that training and personnel was built. It was ready, and as soon as we learn about the Apalachicola system, we're able to pivot and apply all that right at Apalachicola. I moved here like four years ago, and you know, just kind of started work with David Randall. We all were sort of getting our feet wet and you know muddy, and really we've come such a long way. And I feel like we've been able to really get a you know, grasp on a lot of the oyster reefs and the salt marsh dynamics in you know North Florida. This area has become so so near and dear to my heart, and I think it's, you know, I've really become invested, especially in Apalachicola Bay. It's definitely become something that I would love to follow through and continue to figure out what's going on with our oyster populations in Florida. So.
Hannah is currently finishing up her master's degree at Florida State University and working at the Apalachicola National Estuarine Research Reserve. Both her and Tanya are pursuing further education after first being hired as lab technicians. I followed the path of working as a technician first and then going back to school and I tend to think that um, you know, it's good for, for people to get that sort of research experience um, to make sure that it's what they want to do before they go on to school. But there is some sadness in working with someone for several yeah. years and getting them to where you're a perfect team and, and everything is easy and then, and then realize that you've just groomed them to, to move on to another place. They help keep you young, you know, <laughs> kind of pace yourself. You know, make sure you can keep up with them. And, um, it's great. And then to see them sort of develop, you know, they come in and they're really green. Um, they don't really know much. They know a lot about science and they're smart as a whip, but actually doing experiments, not just on a lab bench, but like out there where you got to contend with weather and tides and lots of equipment. It's just been fun to sort of watch them grow. I think part of the appeal of this career for me is just that, you know, every day is definitely not the same. Um, there's always things sort of popping up that can lead you in new directions. Um, whether it's, you know, things don't work and then you have to sort of use your creative ability to come up with a new way to do something, or if you just find something really cool in the field that you didn't expect and then you can sort of pursue that. Those things can create frustration, but, but they're also part of the sort of excitement of what we do. As David returned to witness the Apalachicola research, Randall visited her experiment sites in nearby St. Joseph Bay. In this particular plot, there's just one genotype. And you can see that overall it's not doing too well, especially compared to some of these others surrounding it. That's been sort of a consistent feature of this experiment. A more diverse ecosystem should do better, but her experiments with Spartina showed that a lot of diversity isn't necessarily better than just a little. As long as you have more than one, the, the marsh does consistently pretty well. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a really strong and consistent effect of having more genotypes means you do better. And we found all these latitudinal differences and how reefs function as a result of predators is primarily driven by behavior, the fear of being eaten. They also found differences in which top predators were at play in different regions of the coast. Of course, they made these findings by isolating the effects of fear in manipulated cage experiments. Each cage only contained a portion of the food web. Where a blue crab is a top predator to a periwinkle snail or a mud crab, to a lot of other animals, it's lunch. And so every finding is only the beginning of a new question. Like a discovery that mud crabs might experience fear differently than David and Randall had once believed. We've got five mud crabs in here and 25 clams on oyster shells. And we're seeing how the mud crabs respond to the predator sound, where they eat more or less. Basically what happens is the crabs, when you play a catfish recording, don't eat as many clams over the experimental period as they do if you play a silent recording. Phil feeds a catfish in phase two of the study. Which effect is stronger? The effect of these cues coming through the water or the effect of these catfish sounds? And basically it was really interesting, the response to just playing a catfish vocalization for five minutes in one of these tanks had as large of an effect as pumping in continuously water from a catfish tank over say a two to three hour period. And so to sort of hone in on like basic crab biology and how they can do this, we collaborated with Dr. David Mann at the University of South Florida. David and I drove down to St. Pete one weekend with our mud crabs and we used his very elaborate acoustic setup to basically test exactly what sounds these crabs respond to, what frequencies, and how loud it has to be. They can hear it, it has to be pretty loud, so probably predators have to be pretty close to them. Um, and generally they hear better at lower frequencies, um, but, but both of those things kind of make sense. It wouldn't make much sense for a crab to respond um, to a predator that was, was really far away. In July of 2013, they revisited their original biogeographic sites to sample them with sound. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm rolling. With this new approach, 
they hope to get a little closer to understanding how our coasts work. This is the interface of the land and sea, right? Um, so this is where a huge amount of action is going to happen. On the forgotten coast, that means endangered whooping cranes wintering in marshes on the refuge. Tim and Dusty catching crabs. Oystermen trying to make a living in Apalachicola Bay. Scalloping in St. Joe Bay. Pretty cool to figure out what makes a marsh tick or what makes it all operate and how you know, elegant in a lot of ways it can be. Um, and, and trying to figure out those pieces and understand them so that when they go astray, we can hopefully fix them a little bit is, is good motivation too. In the Grass on the Reef is funded by the National Science Foundation.